I had it on and I turned it off instead of having it off and turning it on. You know, <laughs> green means go. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and pick it right back up with uh, point E, capital E. So in D, we had the, uh, the etymology with oikotome, or oikotomia, depending on whether uh, it's being used as a noun or a verb or whatever, okay? Subpoint E, capital E. There are several synonyms for the edification complex of the soul, colon. So point one, the word light, and that's quote, light, end quote, is sometimes used for the edification complex of the soul. As it is constructed inside of the divine dinosphere, And sometimes for the sphere itself. <clears throat> Psalm forty three three and one hundred and nineteen. So that's Psalm forty three three and forty three one hundred and nineteen. <laughs> Obviously one hundred and nineteen verses. Oh no, excuse me. <laughs> There's not. What am I doing? Psalm 43.3, excuse me, and then 119, verse 130. Sorry about that. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 8 and 9. And 5.13. Romans 13.12. And 1 John 2, 8 through 11. Subpoint little a. So this is subpoint one, subpoint little a. In Psalm 119, 130, we have. I'll give you time to go there, because I'm going to go ahead and go there, too. So Psalm 119. <clears throat> 130. Okay, so in Psalm 119, 130, we have, comma, quote, The unfolding slant opening of your words. And here we have the masculine singular construct of the word pithach. And pithach means to unfold or to open as the doorway of a tent or to give the means of light inside the tent to come out in the open. Okay, and then this is followed by the construct singular of the second person plural noun, davar, or davar, D-A-B-H-A-R, davar, <clears throat> which comes from dibber, D-I-B-B-E-R, and it means to speak with emphasis on the act or fact of speaking. Remember, uh, uh, davar uh, is what you would use if you, if you saw a bear speak, right? You know, it, you, you wouldn't worry about what the bear was saying to you. You would just be amazed at the fact that a bear is talking, <laughs> okay? So that's, that's the word you would use, right? Uh, and so therefore, our word means the result of that speech or words, okay? Since so it talks about the act or fact, so we have the result. And here, the emphasis is on the fact that they are words of importance and not necessarily on the actual words themselves. In other words, all of the word of God is important, and all of it is good for our edification. So he's not worried about the words. He's talking about all of the words. Remember, in Hebrews 4.12, 
we have for the word of God is living and operative and more cutting than any double-edged sword and piercing slant penetrating to the point of division or distinguishing between soul and spirit both joints and marrow, and able to judge the inward thoughts and perceptions of the heart, slant right lobe. If you ever listen to the colonel, that's one of the verses that he always does. And the idea is that all of the word of God is important. So we're not talking about uh, you know, a particular word. We're talking about all of your words. So here we have the fact that God is revealing or unfolding his words to the psalmist, who in this case is David, and to the Jew who went through the desert with the tabernacle that we've just been studying, and who understood the various concentric areas of the tabernacle and later the period, the, the temple, later in the period, the temple, remember, you have the concentric circles. The idea of opening the door or the tent of the holies of holies is what is actually being portrayed here, okay? Because the word that is used for opening is talking about opening the door of a tent. So they're getting the most precious words or Bible doctrine that they're supposed to use to mature. So all of that's wrapped up in that little bit. The unfolding slant opening of your words gives light, semicolon. And here we have the hithiel imperfect third masculine singular of the Hebrew word avar, A-W-A-R, -A -A avar. And that means to light up or to shine. And then it's extended to mean to animate. Okay, when you, uh, uh, the, the idea being that when something's dead, the light goes out, right? Uh, when, when someone dies, the light's gone out of their eyes and things like that. Well, to give light is the opposite. It means to animate. Okay, it gives light, semicolon. It, and it is in parents with a single lines through it, <clears throat> which is not portrayed here in, in the, in the uh, it, it's, the word is actually not there. Okay, it has to be added. And, Usually the New American Standard adds those with an italics, but it's not an italics in this case. It gives discernment, slant understanding. To the simple, slant. An open parents with a single line through it. The ones open to instruction. Close period, parents, period. You have to be careful when, when, you, uh, when you translate these things because many people, to the simple means like the simpleton, the one who's a fool, the one who's stupid. That isn't what this means here. Okay, This means to those who are able to discern, those who are open to discerning. And the word for discernment or understanding is the hithil participle of the masculine absolute singular, bijon, B-I-J-O-N. And that comes from bayan, B-A-Y-A-N. And that means to separate. Therefore, this word comes to mean to separate for understanding, to discern, to perceive, or to recognize. <clears throat> so the idea is when we are trying to understand something, we have to separate it uh, and take it in parts and make sure that we can get it and understand it. Uh, many times, uh, you know, when you want to understand something, uh, you have to sit there and pull it apart word at a time, you know, to figure out what it means, particularly if it's the first time you've seen it. And we've seen that, you know, when you go through school, you see that. Uh, sometimes you see it with mathematical formulas or you see it with other things. So that's where discernment comes from. To discern means to separate, to, uh, to bring it to light, okay? <clears throat> and then the word for simple is the masculine absolute plural of pit. <coughs> Petej, or pete, pe, excuse me, pete. It's P-E-T-I-J, and J, of course, is not, spell, is not said. And it's uh, simple-minded as open to instruction of either wisdom or folly. Okay? It stands for a person who is a learner and a vacuum of information. Okay? The properly functioned be, believer will be open to the truth, the truth of the Word of God. Uh, but we have to be careful because the Word also has a negative connotation, uh, that I said, and, and that means that it, you also have to be careful because you don't want to be open to evil or misleading doctrines. Okay, so altogether we have the unfolding slant opening of your words gives light. It gives discernment, slant understanding to the simple slant the ones open to instruction. Subpoint little b. Receiving the light of the word of God. gives us different emphasis than many believers have. Mm -hmm. 
Our lives are greatly blessed. Not as a result of us doing something for God. But as a result of us receiving something from God. Remember, the confusion of the word work in the book of James uh, to mean doing something and giving out your spiritual grunt destroys the real meaning of the word work, uh, which is process something that you have received from God. So every believer must be a responder before he can be a do doer, and we are responders to the light of Bible or Bible doctrine. Okay. So continue the point. When you receive Bible doctrine, it lights up and animates the soul. Through, through the edification complex. In proper mental dynamics, The emotion responds to the light and is delighted and the right lobe uses the light to continue to build or furnish the ECS. See, we also have this concept, of, you know, with regard to the Shekinah glory, right? And we, we have the Shekinah glory. And the Shekinah glory in the Old Testament was a pillar of fire, right? And a pillar of cloud, and so it was light. And the idea is that you're supposed to manifest the Shekinah glory. You're supposed to manifest that light. You're not supposed to be the uh, dead Christian that walks around in a morose attitude all the time, right? You know, that uh, is unhappy all the time. Uh, if you're unhappy, you're not functioning properly. And so you're supposed to be the individual that's providing light. And when people see this light, see, it, it's like the pregnant woman when people say, oh, you have a glow about you, right? You know, you're supposed to have a glow about you as a believer. People are supposed to see you and say, oh, you know, all of this stuff is getting everybody down. How come you're not down? Right? How come you're not upset about having to wear masks everywhere you go and all these things that are going on, right? You know, how come, uh, how come uh, you can uh, uh, still be uh, in, in, an enjoyable individual uh, during all of this time? And you say, because I have the light. I have the truth of the Word of God. I understand that I'm protected, that God's going to take care of me. Okay? And uh, let me tell you how you can have that too. And bingo, you're ready to give the gospel. Okay? <clears throat> so, subpoint one was light. Subpoint two, this is two with single parents around it. Quote, Christ formed in you, end quote. Christ formed in you. Yeah. So I had E, then subpoint one, light. Subpoint A was Psalm 119, 130. Subpoint B was receiving the light of the word of God. Okay, now we're out to subpoint two. I said subpoint two with single parents around it. Yeah. See, subpoint one, subpoint two. <laughs> Christ formed in you. So we had we had an A and B under here that I didn't put on the screen. Okay, so Christ formed in you in Galatians 
connotes both the ECS and spiritual maturity, or excuse me, and spiritual self-esteem. So Christ formed in you in Galatians 4.19 connotes both the ECS and spiritual self-esteem, period. Through salvation, comma, Christ is positionally in every believer. <clears throat> and you can put in parentheses John 14, 20 and the doctrine of positional truth. Close parents. So Christ is positionally in every believer, but he must also be formed in us experientially Remember, positionally and experientially are just two big words. Positionally means that that uh, you know he's, he's in you. Okay, that's that's a uh, uh, strategic position, right? He's he's inside you. Okay, but you have to operate properly in Christ's plan. Operating is what experientially means. You have to experience it. Okay, uh, so he has to be formed in us experientially, meaning that we must understand. This information and use it in our daily walk with him. See, that's that's part of the problem with. Uh, some of the uh, doctrinal churches is they're so focused on giving you the doctrine and teaching the doctrine and making sure that you get the doctrine that they never talk to you about using it, how to use it, right? And that's what we need to understand. We need to have the experiential part. It's not just good enough that you have the information in your soul, right? That, that you have a file cabinet upon file cabinet upon file cabinet in the Bible doctrine notes, okay? After 30 years, uh, you know, I've got lots of files and lots of notes, right? And the idea is that you don't just have the notes. You've, you've committed those notes to your soul. You know how to use it. See, the reason you're writing it down here is not so that you can go and just store it away. The idea is so that you can get it down. It's a way of learning. One of the ways of learning uh, that, they've, that they've understood uh, in, in classrooms, it's been you know, part of classrooms for years, right? The way teachers teach is they don't just give it to you and you sit there and listen to it and then you got to spit it back. Many people want, you know, college professors as well, have you take notes because there's, there's a process in, in getting it, hearing it, writing it down, right? And then reviewing it before an exam. Okay, and then you get the exam. Well, we get the exams every day, every moment, by God, uh, you know, by the temptations of Satan, by things that go on. So the idea is you don't just write it down, forget it, bring it back out the next Sunday so you can add to it. Okay, you're supposed to be able to get it in your soul and use it. Okay, and that's what, that's what builds up the edification complex. Okay, so it has to be formed experientially so in our daily walk with him. So it's called Christ formed in you. Subpoint three with single parents. <clears throat> quote, the new man, end quote, in Ephesians 4, and Colossians 3, those are the chapters, refers both to the ECS, and the divine dinosphere. That has created the quote, new man in Christ, end quote.
who lives and operates on the doctrine in his soul. Period. So remember, we're supposed to replace our human good and evil and the human viewpoint uh, information that we have in our soul with divine information. And that's how we become the new man. Uh, it's not overnight, okay? It, it takes a process. But the idea is that we replace the corrupt pre-programming that we have from the old sin nature and replace it with divine information so that we can be and operate properly in God's plan. Okay? Subpoint four. Quote, perfectly, slant, fully developed, work, slant, production, end quote. In James 1.4, is used to emphasize the edification complex of the soul as a result of both obtaining and using doctrinal information. And I believe the last time we got the edification complex as a full, uh, a full category was when we were in James, and that was the reason why. Because we talk about, you, you can't just uh, uh, get the information, you have to develop it, and then you have to use it. And that's why we have the, perfectly, the perfect, fully developed work slant production. The idea being that you get it, okay, that's how you develop it, and then you have to use it. And uh, it goes back to any information that you want to turn from just being information to being knowledge. Remember, part of the edification complex of the soul when we look at the soul, and we look at the right lobe of the soul, we see that the building material for the edification complex is wisdom. Well, what's wisdom? Wisdom isn't just information. Wisdom is the information that's been used, you know, been, uh, been uh, 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 massaged into uh, becoming wisdom. It's part of your norms and standards, part of your vocabulary and categories, part of your frame of reference, uh, part of your uh, consciousness, right? So it becomes uh, in, not just information, but it becomes useful information, turning it into knowledge. <clears throat> See, there's a lot of, especially if you study computers and stuff, uh, or communications, one of the things they tell you about communications is you have, the, the, you have data, you have data can turn into information, but then information can't turn into knowledge until it's used, right? So it's sort of like having letters that create words that create sentences, right? Letters in and among themselves don't give you anything <laughs> that's knowledgeable, you know, that, that's intelligible, uh, even words. You can go and, uh, you know, get the dictionary and randomly pick out words, and that's not, you know, that's not something that's going to, uh, to uh, help you get by. You have to take those words in the right order, uh, read them, get them in your, into your brain, and then you can use them, okay, as knowledge. Well, it's the same thing with doctrine. Doctrine, you can get it. You can get it. You can write notes on it. You can put it away in your cabinet. You cannot think about it until the next time you have class and write some more on it, right? But unless you actually take it and apply it and think of scenarios where you would apply it and get comfortable with it and use it. Until you do that, it's not wisdom. It's just doctrine. Okay? So it has to be wisdom. Okay? And so the new man, or excuse me, the perfectly or fully developed work slant production has to become uh, wisdom. It has to be used. Okay? So is used to emphasize the ECS as a result of both obtaining and using doctrinal information. It is the construct Excuse me, it is the construction, not the construct, <laughs> it's like I was exegeting again. It is the construction of the ECS with emphasis on the production of divine good. 
That's what this phrase means. It's the construction of the ECS with emphasis on the production of divine good. When we have the ECS, we are said to be perfect or mature, comma, entire or complete, and lacking nothing, period. See, God said that Job was not lacking. He was complete. He had, he had an edification complex, okay? <clears throat> So the work that you're doing can't be divine good unless you have the doctrine behind it and are doing it out of information associated with the doctrine. Okay, And that goes back to, again, the concept of uh, how can you tell if, a, if a, an event is divine good or not. And the idea is you can't. From the event itself, you can't tell. You have to be able to get into the mind of the person that created the information. And if they're doing it from a relaxed mental attitude associated with being under the filling of God the Holy Spirit in the divine dinosphere and using information from their edification complex, then it's divine good. If not, it's human good and evil, no matter what it is, even if it's, like I said, jumping on a hand grenade to, to save your squad. Subpoint five. Quote, imitators of God, end quote. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, and Ephesians 5, 1, emphasizes the attainment of maturity. by growth through the renewing of your mind, period. Once again, this is accomplished through the ingestion and metabolization of Bible doctrine as the quote, mind of Christ, end quote, period, end quote. I'm going to give you Ephesians 5.1 in corrected translation. Ephesians 5.1 says, <clears throat> Therefore, Go there, see what it says. Become, this is therefore become, it doesn't say be, it says become. Uh, and then and again, we have an important concept here. Uh, become is uh, the Greek word ginomai, and it means to become something you were not before. Okay? And it involves, it involves an activity to become something you were not before. It's more active than to just be. See, be is a status quo verb. To become is an active verb. So in the corrected translation, it's therefore become, as opposed to in the general translators, they have therefore be imitators of God. See, Sometimes the subtlety is so very important. To be an imitator of God, you could, if you were to read this, I don't know what it says, if you were to read this 
as just therefore be imitators of God. It would be an activity that you could do once or twice or, you know, on, on call, right? You know, it's like, yeah, I'm going to be an imitator of God now, but I'm not tomorrow, right? Here the idea to become imitators is more than to just be. It means to actually embrace and have your whole, have your whole mental attitude changed, right? It's, it's not an acting activity. It's, it's a, it's a, it comes from the real change that comes in your soul. That's the difference between becoming something and just being something. Okay, is that you can look at it almost like an actor. An actor can be almost anybody he wants to be, but he doesn't become that person, you know, as opposed to uh, someone who's a shapeshifter and does become that person. Okay, <laughs> so so that's why these little words sometimes are so important. So we have become from ginomai means to become something you were not before. Therefore, become imitators. An imitator is the Greek word mimetes. M I M long E T long E S mimetes, and that means an imitator that tries to make a perfect copy of something. Okay, so to become an imitator means to be as perfect a copy as you can. And by the way, mimetes is the root of our English word. Here's a blast from the past for those of you that that uh, remember these of a mimeograph. <laughs> okay. When I was a kid, you always wanted those mimeograph uh, uh, copies because, boy, they smelled good and they get you high, right? Yeah. <laughs> For those of you that never experienced it, what a mimeograph was is they would type the original, okay, onto a piece of uh, a special type of paper, like a carbon paper, right? They would put it on a drum, all right, and then they would run the papers through, and the drum would come and it would suck up ink, and it would only put copies where you know would only make a, put ink where the uh, type was not. Okay, uh, it was kind of a reverse type of a process, right? But it would make an exact copy or close to it of what the original was. Uh, usually the edges were a little bit blurry, right? <laughs> and uh, the original was usually you know um, a black type paper, and the mimeographs were always blue, right? <laughs> you know? But I used to love to run a little mimeograph machine. It was really cool. Anyway, that's where mimetes, that's, that's where the word comes from. So, therefore, become imitators of God, comma. Of course, that's the, uh, the uh, genitive of theos, <clears throat> meaning uh, God, and with emphasis on his, uh, on his uh, sovereignty, okay, of God, as beloved children. And children is, and beloved children is technon agapetes, or agapetos, excuse me, technon agapetos. And of course, technon means a child. That means a child with a very special relationship. It doesn't just mean any child. It means a child who has a special relationship with uh, the parent or the individual. And then the agapetos, of course, is where we get love or beloved. Okay, and so we're talking about a very special uh, uh, relationship. We're talking about child, children who are valued and prized. Okay, uh, not very many of those these days, uh, which are actually a result of the parents not doing proper parenting. Okay, uh, uh, you know, if, if you uh, have all these children that nobody wants, <laughs> it's usually because they, they weren't trained properly. Although there's incorrigible child, children that no matter how well they're trained, they're still going to be horrible kids. But the idea is uh, if you don't train children, you end up with Lord of the Flies, right? Okay, <clears throat> so we're talking about beloved children. So all together, we have Ephesians 5.1, Therefore, become imitators of God as beloved children. It's not that different than what they have in the general translators, but the idea is the B is actually the become. Now, continuing this point, it says to imitate God, comma, you need to know God, and to know God, You need doctrine. And this is made clear in verse 2, which I didn't give you. But in verse 2, it talks about walking in love, or in the sphere of love. So this is made clear in verse 2, which states that we are to walk in the sphere of love. Period. End quote. So what that means is you have to get doctrine while in the divine dynasphere. The sphere of love is the divine dynasphere. And so the only way you can get to know God is to, to get the information through the sphere of love in the divine dynasphere, getting doctrinal information, putting it in your soul, and using it to get to know God. You can't love something you don't know. 
because we're talking here about personal love. That's why we have beloved children. It's not children that impersonal love, it's personal love. And the way you have a personal love relationship is you get to know the individual or the thing that you're going to have a personal love relationship with. See, that's why you can't do the uh, mail order bride and have a personal love relationship. You can do the mail order bride and have an impersonal love relationship until such time as you potentially grow to love each other. <laughs> okay, and that's what uh, in the Old Testament and in, in a lot of societies today depend on. They do the uh, you know they do the uh, arranged marriages, and the idea is you know the poor girl says, but I don't love him. Well, you don't yet, but maybe you'll grow to love him, right? You, so you have to have the impersonal love relationship first to have the personal love. But you get to, you have to know something to love something from a personal perspective. That's why we have courtship. See, that's why you don't, uh, you know, have love at first sight and go and marry, uh, you know, someone that you met three days ago, you know, or, you know, God forbid, in a drunken stupor in Las Vegas the night before, or whatever. <laughs> you, you, have to, you have to get to know the individual, okay? Ah, but there's a warning there, and uh, that warning we were talking about when we were studying Proverbs the other day, the other side of the warning is, you have a past, your wife has a past, and you don't necessarily need to share it with each other. You have the right to personal privacy. You don't have to. Uh, you don't have to espouse that's ever happened in your life to your other, you know, to your spouse, and she doesn't have to do it to you either. You guys are still individuals, and you have a right to privacy. Okay, so uh, you know, many times, just leave the past in the past, <laughs> okay, and move forward. All right. And don't have this, uh, this idea that when you're married, you have to share every single thing. Particularly things that, uh, if you say aloud, give Satan the information in which to attack you. Right? Uh, if, you, if you have information that you don't want to say, right, if your wife or your husband is pestering, what are you thinking about? What are you doing? What are you thinking? You know, just say, it's none of your business. <laughs> and they ought to be able to say, okay, okay, that's love. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> all together we have Ephesians 5 1, therefore become imitators of God as beloved children. And to imitate God, you need to know God. To know God, you need doctrine. Of course, this refers to getting doctrine while in divine dynasphere, as made clear in verse 2, which states that we are to walk in the sphere of love. Sub point 6 quote, the glory of God, end quote. In Jeremiah 13, 16, Romans 5, 2, and 1 Corinthians 11, 7. Just as the right woman is the glory of the right man. See, the right woman is the, the helper that perfectly matches the man. And as you both grow spiritually, okay, the right woman is going to be the glory of the man. Uh, and the, that's the idea of why she wears her hair long and he wears his hair short. Right is uh, is to uh, show off that glory. The woman is showing that she is um, uh, obeying the man uh, by having her hair long, and the man is showing that he obeys God by having his hair short. Okay, and so the idea is that the woman is the glory of the right man. So just as the right woman is the glory of the right man, comma, <coughs> comma, so the believer, with a full soul of doctrine. And a completed edification complex is the glory of God, period. When we studied sin, one of the things that comes up is people say, well, why did, you know, if God knew that the angels were going to sin, right, that, uh, you know, one-third of the angels were going to fall and that there were going to be men, mankind that falls and, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and never accepts Christ and ends up going into the lake of fire, why did he do it in, in the first place? Why did he even create the universe? Why did he even create mankind and, and, you know, the angels and then mankind, right? 
Well, one of the answers is for his glory, right? Because what happens is, even with the potential of sin being there, even with the potential of, uh, uh, of infinite destruction, spending eternity in the lake of fire being there, there are going to be individuals, namely us and those before, the believers before us, okay, that are going to accept the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to accept the truth of the word of God. We're going to uh, uh, operate in the divine dynosphere and operate under the principles and the information based in the truth of the word of God. And all of this glorifies God. So God allowed it to happen. God created it and then allowed sin to come into the world. Okay, he didn't create sin. He created the, the universe and, and angels and then mankind, okay, uh, to, to, for his glory. And how does he have glory? He has glory when we have a completed edification complex and we're mature believers. It shows in the whole angelic conflict that God's plan is superior to the plan of Satan. Even with everything that Satan's trying to do, and even with the cosmic system completely uh, act uh, active, there are individuals who can get through it, function properly, reach maturity, have fantastic blessings in time, and a whole lot of blessings in, in eternity through the use of the plan of God, through his power and his plan. And that glorifies God. So the edification complex glorifies God. When you have it in your soul, you're showing that you're using his information. You're not doing it yourself. You're using his power. So just as the right woman is the glory of the right man, so the believer with a soul, with a full soul of doctrine and a completed edification complex is the glory of God, period. <coughs> and what I just said, I'm going to give you a note. <laughs> we are left on this earth after salvation. To glorify God and we must have a means of doing that period God doesn't depend on our talent or ability. Or human IQ. Yet his plan in eternity past to have yet his plan in eternity past called for each of us in the devil's world to glorify and represent him. So God doesn't depend on our talent or our ability or human IQ, yet his plan in eternity past called for each of us in the devil's world to glorify and represent him. So if he, if he uh, <coughs> depends depends on that and demands that of us, then how do we do it? Okay, well, obviously we have to do it through his power. Continuing the point then. Therefore, we do this, and the this is glorify and represent him. We do this through the non-meritorious perception and application of doctrine leading to a soul full of doctrine that can be applied to all circumstances in life. This maturity
and the completed ECS. Reflect the glory of God. Since it is only through the plan of God that they can be attained. So as I was saying, why aren't we called home the minute we accept Christ? Right? You know, you can do that. The minute you accept Christ, boom, you're gone. Right? Well, when we use our volition to accept the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf for salvation, why aren't we immediately taken into heaven? And why do we stay here? After all, we have shown that man's volition can be used properly and that God is superior to Satan. And God's plan is superior to Satan's plan simply by the fact that we accepted it. So then why aren't we redeemed? The minute we're redeemed from the slave market of sin, why aren't we taken home? And the reason is that we're left here for one reason and one reason only, and that's to glorify God. Okay? And you've probably heard that phrase many times. I was usually to imply that you have to do something. You have to give faithfully to the church. Right? Uh, an example of that, I, I have here in my notes, to remember, something that I remember. The example of that is, I grew up Catholic, okay? We had two churches down, two Catholic churches down in Yuma. We had St. Francis, which was named after St. Francis of Assisi, right? Assisi, we had St. Francis's church, and we had uh, the Church of Guadalupe, right? You know, uh, uh, you know of, of uh, uh, Mary, okay? <clears throat> and we were in the neighborhood where we went to St. Francis. And so we went to St. Francis from the time I was born, basically, by the time we moved into, into, into Yuma to begin with. Uh, and, you know, we went to St. Francis. And my dad, you know, gave every Sunday to the church, right? You know, they'd pass the basket around and they had little envelopes and you had to put the envelopes in and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And so my dad, you know, I don't know that he ever listened to class because every time I, when I was a kid, every time I'd look over at him, he was like this, you know. He's <laughs> It's <laughs> kind of asleep, but we used to, we asked, you know, you had to kneel at the right time. And he, he, he grew up, okay, where he went to parochial school. And so he was, you know, he had the Catholic liturgy and the whole, the whole mass, you know, memorized. So even in his sleep, he could, he could kneel when he was supposed to, stand when he was supposed to, sit when he was supposed to, thump his heart when he was supposed to. I mean, he did all that stuff, right? So you learn all that things, right? So anyway, my siblings and I, we grew up in the, in the Catholic church. My, my sister is the eldest of us kids, right? And she went to get married, and when she went to get married, she was uh, 20 years old, something like that, yeah, 20 years old, 21 maybe. Anyway, uh, she was past 18, let me put it that way, past the age of majority, right? And so she and my dad went to talk to the priest to arrange, uh, you know, when would be, when they could have the church to get married, and they arranged for the priest to marry him and everything, and the priest said, I can't marry you. And the reason they couldn't marry her was because she was of the age of majority, and she hadn't been giving to the church. You talk about someone being mad. Boy, you know, my dad with an Italian temper, I've seen him mad several times, but boy, was he mad. I thought that priest was lucky to live, right? <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> okay. So, well, the other church, uh, you know, the other church let her get married. So we ended up going all the way down to the valley, which was, you know, back in those days seemed to be quite a ways, right? You know, and went to a different Catholic church for her to get married. Okay. Well, <clears throat> That's the example here when I'm talking about sometimes uh, this idea uh, that, you know, you have to, you're left here to glorify God has to do with you're supposed to be faithfully giving to the church. Not true. You have to be baptized. That's not true. Okay. And Jack used to have a story about an associate that he, that he knew that was going to be a Jesuit priest. The guy went through, uh, you know, went through the college, the Jesuit college and everything, was getting ready to be a, a priest. And in doing a background check, quote unquote, they found out that he hadn't been baptized as a baby. So they wouldn't let him be a priest. So he ended up joining the Navy, and that's how Jack knew him, okay? Or you have to witness to so many people a day or spend so much time in prayer, da-da-da. But, of course, none of that is true, okay? We're here to glorify God in time through what? Through the development of the edification complex of the soul and the attainment of maturity through the trials and circumstances in the angelic conflict. That's why we're doing this study real quick, was because in our verse we had the idea of suffering circumstances, okay? When we witness to the angels through our development of maturity, 
and our application of doctrine to handle suffering circumstances, then we are glorifying God. Through its application, we're given the opportunity to witness to unbelievers and to help increase the body of Christ. Uh, the proper witness as a result of maturity in the ECS is the glorification of God. Through all this and all the other activities in the Christian life, uh, they fall into their proper perspective through the idea of understanding how glorification comes about. It's through maturity and the ECS that we produce divine good works. It's through the ECS that we receive the gold, silver, and precious stones. Uh, these will, of course, last into eternity, and it's through these that God is glorified throughout all of eternity, not just in time, but all of eternity, just as ECS and the maturity reflect on the glory of God now. Okay? That's why we're here. So you're not here to create a legacy for yourself. You're here because God is revealing his legacy through you. That's one of the things you need to understand. Many people want to make sure that they leave a legacy for their children. They want to be the richest person there is. You know, you have people like Bill Gates who want to leave this great legacy. Well, you, as a properly functioning believer, are leaving a much greater legacy than anyone like that will ever leave. Because you're glorifying Christ and you're revealing his legacy. And that's what you want to do. You want to be the pipeline through which the glory of God comes out. Okay? That's the Shekinah glory. <clears throat> There's a line, this is getting old now, but I have this example here too. If you've ever seen the movie Shall We Dance, okay, the movie with Richard Greer, and, and he starts dancing, right, you know, and his wife thinks he's having an affair, she hires a private investigator to find out where he's going, and she finds out that he's dancing. Anyway, in the movie Shall We Dance, uh, there's, a, there's an, an, an instance where the wife uh, of the main character is speaking to a private investigator, right, and she says people get married and share their lives with someone because they want a witness to their lives. So they want to know that what they've done has mattered to someone. And while it makes good for a chick flick, it's actually a horrible thought. <laughs> Your life is lived and witnessed by all those around you, human and angelic. Okay? It isn't so that you have a witness with a person. It means that you have the witness of the angelic creation and a witness for all eternity because you're glorifying God. That's how you're supposed to live your life. Not so that you are remembered, but so that God is remembered through you. So you make a difference for all eternity whether anyone remembers you or not. It's because of your proper witness that you'll receive all the above and beyond blessings in eternity. And you've got the new name, the pillar, the wreaths, all of those things that we've studied in the past come as a result of not glorifying yourself, but glorifying God. See? <clears throat> An example of that that is, is, uh, can be used right now with the Olympics going on is we have these Olympic athletes that are there to try and glorify themselves. They're there to make a point themselves, right? The idea of turning away from the national anthem or, or uh, you know, uh, uh, like in the, the 76 Olympics, you know, the black power symbol and all that stuff, trying to glorify themselves. They're there to represent the United States, not to represent themselves. They're supposed to represent the best of the United States. The opportunities of freedom that allowed them to, uh, to reach the pinnacle of their athletic career, okay? The idea is that they're supposed to show off uh, what the United States has to offer, the fact that we have these freedoms that allow them to do that. But instead, they'd make it all about them. And consequently, we're not making the showing that we've made in past Olympics. We're way down on the medal count compared to where we used to be. We used to be right at the top, now we're like three or four, okay? Uh, and uh, the idea is we have these athletes that are arrogant and they're losing, right? The American gymnasts were set to get a gold. Everyone thought they were going to get a gold. They got a silver, right? Uh, the the uh, swimmers are, seem to be doing pretty well. But the other concept of it is many people who used to watch it don't watch it anymore. I don't watch the Olympics I see it now and then. The news tells me what the, the count is and stuff. But it's not like it was when I was a kid. And you waited for it and you watched it because you were proud of the United States and what they re represented. Nobody in my generation forgets about the hockey team beating the Russians. Okay? They were representing the United States when they beat the Russians. They weren't representing themselves as a goalie or as a, you know, as a forward or whatever. Right? It was a team. And that team was representing the three letters they had on their back. Well, it's the same thing as a believer. We represent God. We don't represent us. It's not our legacy. It's God's legacy. That's how we glorify God.
Okay? So all that comes through the glory of God. That's the edification complex of the soul. Subpoint seven. Quote, Christ dwelling in your heart, slant right lobe. End quote. In Ephesians 3, 13, period. Ephesians 3, 13. So Christ dwelling in your heart in Ephesians 3, 13. It is in the edification complex that Christ dwells in your soul. He can only dwell and function as long as you're in fellowship and functioning on Bible doctrine. He can only dwell and function as long as you are in fellowship and functioning on Bible doctrine. The quote house, end quote, is built. Remember we have the <coughs> verses from Proverbs. Psalms, excuse me. The house is built and furnished for the purpose of you being able to dwell there and use it. Remember, with wisdom a house is built, and with understanding it is furnished with all great and, and uh, wonderful things. Okay, That's the idea of the edification complex of the soul. So the house is built and furnished for the purpose of you being able to dwell there and use it, comma, but also for the purpose of being able to have fellowship with Christ at all times. When you malfunction, Christ can no longer reside there. And instead, and instead, he, quote, stands at the door and knocks, period, end quote. That's Revelation 3.20. This knocking is to get you to rebound and let him back in to have fellowship with you. So remember, this isn't a salvation passage. Many people have memorized it as, as a salvation passage, right? I stand at the door and knock. Uh, you know, it's not a salvation passage. He's not knocking on your heart to allow you to allow him in so that, he, you know, so that you can be saved. 
Okay, it refers to opening the door, uh, you know, and rebound and allow him back in, okay, to have fellowship with him. Okay, if you refuse to open the door, in other words, refuse to rebound, you'll no longer have fellowship with God and you will be at the next level of discipline. And that leaves us ready for point eight, which is where we'll pick it up next week. Okay, so we'll go ahead and end with a song.